I'm from Michigan. So my name is Dallas Hasselhan. I'm a researcher at Eastern Michigan University. I specifically study tarantulas. I've been studying tarantulas for close to about a decade. Um, I work out on the grasslands during their mating season, things like that. Um, I brought a bunch of my equipment just so you can see kind of what I do and stuff. We've been trying to keep an eye out for tarantulas <laughs> here, and we just, we're not seeing them, of course, and this happens because I'm out here every day counting tarantulas. I'll see 30 of them on my drive, get to my site, walk my 2,500 square feet and sees nothing. <laughs> so they're never here. So the biggest thing I'll start with is I'm doing a lot of monitoring projects. So this species, uh, it's, it's one species across this whole grass and they range from southeast or southwest Texas up into New Mexico, up here. You'll get them all the way over into Missouri. Um, everyone calls them whatever state they're in. They, they're Texas Browns, Oklahoma Browns, Missouri Browns. No one calls them Colorado Browns officially, but I say we should because it's here, <laughs> right? Um, and yeah, and so the issue is uh, with birds and things like that, you get thousands of papers, you know, thousands of papers, uh, scientific papers explaining different parts of their uh, like habitat, life, all that sort of stuff. This species of tarantula, it's the most widespread species in the United States. It's the most populous in the United States. And there are 11 papers on it. And that's it. That's and most line. of them are genetic papers on how they relate to other tarantulas in the US. Um, so we don't even know basic like facts about their life history and things like that, you know, what they're doing and stuff. Uh, everyone has really good ideas because tarantulas, you can use other species of tarantulas to kind of gauge how they are. Um, but the way that I usually explain it to people is like, it's like if you wanted to study polar bears and all you knew about was black bears. So there's gonna be some cross there, but you're gonna get face to face with a polar bear and go, that's not a black bear. <laughs> <laughs> and so a lot of my work is monitoring things right now because we don't even have basic information of how many are out here. Um, you know, are, is it a healthy population? You know, uh, you talk to a lot of locals around here and they'll say, oh, we see less and less every year and things like that. But we don't have any data to back that up. It's all just hearsay to an extent. But that information is super important because it does start showing trends because people, for the most part, are pretty reliable with those sort of things. Um, so what I'm looking at specifically is the timing of their mating season, right? Uh, sometimes you hear it called migration and things like that. That's a little taboo at the moment to say, you know, we'll figure that out. Um, but we don't even know exactly what makes them come out to mate. Um, we have pretty good ideas. Everyone in town and all the locals here, you go, oh, it's the first snow. Oh, it's the first time it gets cold. You know, everyone's got a good idea because they're around them so much here. Um, but we don't actually have a good time and date. So that's the bulk of my work out here right now is I'm out here every single day. Um, I give myself like one day off um, <laughs> and I'm out here at the coldest point. So it's usually like 630 in the morning. Um, Do you see them in the morning? Mm -hmm. So that's the really fun thing about the males is they just kind of find a spot to sleep for the night um, when they get tired. So you'll find them at that morning. There you go. It was two degree, uh, like 34 degrees Celsius the other, or excuse me, Fahrenheit uh, the other morning. And there was one just curled up under a little piece of grass because that's all it could find. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and so that's the bulk of my work is going out counting the ones I see at certain temperatures and things like that. Um, but the other stuff, you know, so I have to make sure, you know, I measure them. So I've got a good old scale that I carry around with me to make sure I can get weights and see maybe heavier males and bigger males are coming out earlier or something. We don't know. Uh, I've got different, you know, measuring tapes and things like that to measure them. I'm taking samples of like grass. So I throw this around, take a picture of it, and then I can go, all right, there's 20% grass here, 30% bare dirt, that sort of thing. So we get an idea of um, all that sort of stuff. Um, but the funnest, the most fun, <laughs> my antenna <laughs> reading. <laughs> so a tarantula is pretty small. So that means if you want to track one, you have to have a really tiny tracker. That's so cool. So what I do um, is it is their mating season. That's important to remember. Um, what I do is I super glue this to the back of the tarantula. And the reason I use super glue is because it's non-toxic to animals. Um, that's why you can use it in like fish tanks and aquascapes and things like that um, once it dries. But more so, it's really easy to remove with some pressure. 
because tarantulas are hairy, it just super glues to that hair. So then all I have to do is get a hold of the tarantula and just pull it off and it makes them bald. Um, I, don't know if that, I don't know if that hurts their chances or anything like that, but we'll see. Are you putting it on their carapace or are you putting it on their abdomen? Yep, so right on top of the, right behind their eyes. Okay. Because um, cool. if I put it on their abdomen, uh, it's a little too fleshy. And yeah. So that's where it could potentially hurt them. Mm -hmm. and I'm trying not to. Um, so what this looks like is it's in my car and I turn on my very loud and annoying static <laughs> and I walk around the grassland holding this up and there's going to be a lot of interference because we got a bunch of radios here and I listen really carefully for a little tiny click. Let's see. That. Oh, that's cool. And that means I'm facing it. So if I start turning it away, to, it gets a little quieter. And then as I get closer, it gets louder and louder until I'm facing directly it. And then I start walking. And then I keep walking. <laughs> and then it gets quiet again and I go, oh. <laughs> and I go, all right, back this way. And it takes me sometimes easy, sometimes not easy. Uh, especially when, um, because the males are looking for nice places to warm up at night or stay warm at night. A lot of times, especially this time of year, they'll find a nice female burrow and crawl in and say, hey, do you need company for the night? <laughs> and she goes, I could use dinner. Um, <laughs> so what happens is I'll start like walking in circles. Exactly. <laughs> I'll start walking in circles going, where is this thing? And I'll see a little hole. Oh. And I go, oh no. And I can take this off. You know, I can, I can just detach this, pull this off, and it makes it a little bit louder when I'm directly on it. And I drop it down the hole, and it's going beep, beep, beep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> so now I have to. So you don't get it back. I fish them out. I, I, I have, yeah. I have like a little like a pipe cleaner type of yeah. doodad that, uh, like a coat hanger that I've fishing tool. Yeah, yeah, and I just kind of start <laughs> digging and pulling, and eventually I'll pull something out. You know, uh, really <laughs> retrieve them. I, I usually get about. Unfortunately, I get about like two thirds of them back. So I usually lose about lose about a third of them just because coyotes will grab the tarantulas and then they're real gone um, or worse, a bird or something like that. Um, so the birds eat, eat the tarantulas? Mm -hmm. yep. It's just a hawk soaring back over here. And yeah. following us. The way that I like to think of it is they're just really nice little protein bars yeah. for any of the animals out here. So it's real nice when you're wandering around looking for you know, jackrabbits or something, and there's just a little hairy thing that doesn't really carry you there, and you can just go. Kind of so does does the bird have something in its throat to protect it against the urticating hairs then, or how does that so work? The, so the urticating hairs that all, uh, all New World tarantulas, so anything in North and South America have, um, what it is is there's actually seven, or depending on who you're asking, 11 different specialized hairs. And what those hairs are for is they're for defensive properties, right? But they're all targeted to whatever their main predators are. So out here, their hairs are are pretty good against mammals, but not so much against reptiles and oh. birds. So when the birds are eating them, they might not notice the hairs. Whereas if we get, you know, if you start messing with the tarantula and stuff, sometimes we'll throw hairs at you and it gets in your eyes and it's like itchy as it's on your skin. It can kind of feel like fiberglass. Mm. Um, Whereas if you go down to the tropics where there's a lot of birds, their hairs don't bother people at all. They oh. bother birds a lot or reptiles or things like that. So it's That's cool. Little, it's a little trace and stuff. Um, what, yeah. What's the name of the hairs again? Uh, they're called urticating hairs. Yep. Um, so <laughs> with these spiders, since Colorado obviously has really bad winters, so is there something special about these particular phonopelmas and their hemoglobin that protects them, or is it just that they're getting their burrow down far enough to protect themselves? I wish we knew that. <laughs> it's not something we know. At all. Mm -hmm. um, cool. There's an instinct to go. Yeah, of course, it's going to be something like that, right? Um, they're at their most. This is the northernmost part of their range. Like you said, it gets really cold here compared to the ones down in New Mexico or Texas. Um, so you would assume they have something there, but we really just don't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, a lot of the genetics works and things like that, you end up having to kill the individuals. Um, and my lab specifically is a like no kill um, That's cool. lab. Um, we let the geneticists handle that stuff, you know, because being so small, you need a lot of tarantulas to get a good amount of DNA or, you know, blood and whatnot. So it gets a little tricky, uh, but it's a wonderful question. I think we want to know absolutely more. We just don't have good methods of getting it that's safe for the spiders, things like that.
Do you only get these particular Phonopomas here, or do the Chalcodes ever come up here? Do you ever see any of the other morphs? Nope, it's just the hens out here, and it's it's just oh, this really general. Cool. And there's another spider. Oh, hey, there's a spider crossing oh, yeah. the road. Oh, if you need one. And there's 14. <laughs> 14. <laughs> Watch out for some cars coming. He's a big guy. Obviously, the bus is coming, but. Dust storm. So, did you. Oh. Do you know how the males find the female girls? Sure. So they, they no, they just wander enough and then they find like yeah, they can so when sense they, a hole. And yep, when they get down. somewhat close, maybe about a little bigger than a dinner plate size, but maybe three feet, uh, the females will set out little uh, lines that might guide the males to, but I've watched males walk right past the burrow and then walk three feet that way and go, oh, and turn around <laughs> and find the burrow then. Um, so it is out yeah, so the, the females will lay little tiny silk lines. Oh, so it's actually it's a spider web. It's yeah, a little exactly. web. And yep. Yeah, so it's a little tiny, like, little silk line. line. It's like a tripwire, isn't it? Somewhat, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's how maybe there's somewhat pheromones or something like that involved that they, the males can smell and scent. Uh, but for the most part, again, unfortunately, we really don't know and right. have good answers. We know what some other tarantulas do, and we know what they do in labs. But out here, it's yeah. a whole new ballgame. You know, in, in our lab, we have about 3,500 tarantulas. Um, so we have really good data on when they're at 80 degrees their entire lives at high humidity and not have to worry about anything. <laughs> but when we get out here and it's freezing at night, yeah. what are they doing? Um, and that's where it gets tricky. Uh, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> so since so you get to see... Big one. So the females, the largest female I've gotten is around... 14 grams, 14 so pretty grams, good. Huh? The males okay. typically are between four to seven grams. So they're usually about oh. half the weight of the Oh, wow, okay. Um, <laughs> they typically share about the same like leg span <laughs> with some minor variation there, uh -huh. but for the most part, it's it's around that weight. So yeah. So I specifically work with uh, tarantulas out of uh, Shillington's Arachnid Lab at Eastern Michigan. Uh, we do some work with Paula Cushing at the uh, Denver Natural History Museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. DMNS. <laughs> yes, I, I can never remember that. Actually. I know they changed it. Yeah. I don't know, 20 years ago, and most people still call it the Museum of Natural History. Yeah. Uh, how many How many years have you been doing this study? Or are you planning? This, this is the first study? year doing this study. Okay. So this is actually the first study on the Scarlet in tar on tarantulas since about 2015. Wow. So that's that's how little is studied. Mm -hmm. uh, Paula Cushing has a great. Um, talk that she gave uh, the other night yeah. um, but she mentions there's only about 600 arachnologists in the whole world versus something like birds that has thousands and thousands of people what it means is our arachnid conferences that we have every year are really fun because it's <laughs> the same people you see every time and you get to know each other so yeah so sometimes what you see with tarantula keepers is they'll see like sudden death syndrome mm -hmm. um do you ever see that in the wild or anything like that if it's dead in the wild, something probably got it, but mm -hmm. who knows. Um, the Part of the issue with sudden death syndrome is a lot of just misinformation mm -hmm. in the pet trade um, and what, how to properly keep certain animals. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big cause for those deaths is it's just not optimal conditions for them and things like that. Even though they have thousands, you know, hundreds of other animals uh -huh. and they're fine, sometimes it just, they're, they're, they can get very sensitive, you know. Okay. Um, but yeah. Thank you.